Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. Hamvention 2018 is in the books as Xenia enjoys a second more successful year playing host to Dayton. We will have a retrospective look back. Post-launch signals are received on the ground as amateur radio heads for the dark side of the moon. CQ Magazine announces its 2018 Hall of Fame inductees. The ARRL renews its Memorandum of Understanding with Saturn. And the League publishes a white paper that provides context for recommended governance changes. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to discuss the now in effect GDPR, the Global Data Protection Regulation, and why he thinks that Twitter has become the internet's nervous system. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLEB, tells us how a waterfall display works. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives as he travels back to 1958, when satellites were a new thing. And we'll take a look back at last week's Hamvention with several different reports. That's all straight ahead as edition number 1004 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where for the first time this year we have the three H's, hazy, hot, and humid with pending thunderstorms, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from the Western Catskills on this Memorial Day 2018, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where summer has arrived with a vengeance, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And from Studio One in our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Hamvention 2018 returned to the Greene County Fairgrounds at Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio for its second year, earning high marks for attendance, the debut of many new amateur radio transceivers, and tasty food. Other than the rain showers Friday and Saturday, the event seemed to go very smoothly, said QSD editor Steve Ford, WB8IMY, who'd been on hand for many past Hamventions. Many attendees, great food, and a spacious layout made it easy to get around. It's a much better venue than Hera, he added. Others who commented on the Hamvention Facebook page agreed, although some complained that the flea market area was too small, still muddy, and not as well attended as in past years when the flea market was at Dayton Hamvention. Many credited the Dayton Amateur Radio Association for putting on a great show while addressing needed improvements. Ford said the rain, which included a Saturday thundershower, did not deter the crowds, although indoor exhibit areas are packed at times, reminiscent of the steamy traffic jams of the past at the Hera during the wet weather. ARRL Expo, the focus of ARRL's Hamvention presence, saw considerable traffic, and visitors kept those trending the store quite busy. Ford said the attendees seemed to appreciate the ARRL stage, where talks on various topics were presented throughout the show. Marketing manager Bob Enderblitzen, NQ1R, said the team included nearly 100 people from field organization volunteers, section managers, officers, directors, vice directors, partners, the staff, and members who helped out. Ford postulated the Hamventions 2018 may have witnessed a record number of new amateur radio products. New transceivers included ICOM's IC7610, Kenwood's TS890S, Yesu's FTDX101D, and Flex Radio's Flex 6400M and Flex 6600M. Com Radio introduced its CTX10, a compact SDR-based QRP transceiver. Other new products range from CW keys to digital mode interfaces to audio processors and amplifiers. The August issue of QSD will provide a roundup. Showers persisted into Saturday. Hamvention's attempts to mitigate last year's mud issues into the flea market seemed to help, although the relentless rain proved to be a challenge for it observed. As a result, the indoor exhibits appeared to receive the lion's share of the traffic. 
Perhaps as a result of wet weather, Hamvention forums proved popular. For example, a nearly standing room only crowd to the RTTY contesting forum towards the Southwestern Division's Vice Director Ned Stearns, AA7A, to discuss FT8 as a possible replacement for RTTY in contest applications. Stearns has been involved in improving out FT8 de-expedition mode. The AWRL membership forum also drew a substantial crowd after comments by President Rick Roderick, K5UR, Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, addressed a potential change of the Amateur Radio Emergency Service Program. The skies cleared on Sunday and bargain hunters flocked to the fairgrounds. A number of exhibitors commented that it was the largest Hamvention Sunday attendance they'd seen in a long time. Young attendees seem to be in greater evidence this year, including teams of students interested in combining amateur radio with robotics. For example, the first robotics competition teams were on hand to demonstrate their creations. The Yasme Foundation sponsored Ham Radio 2.0, innovation and discovery area that was a big hit. Yasme Foundation President Ward Silver in 0AX said, Subjects range from high bandwidth satellite set designs to summits on the air. Ham SCR's 2017 Solar Eclipse QSO party research, and QSLs. Silver said the goal was to help diverse groups meet and interact. Researcher Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, who staffed the Ham Psi booth, reported a tremendous response. Florian Zwing, OE3FTA of Austria, and Kus Fik, DR6KF of South Africa presented the IARU Region 1 group Youngsters on the Air, promoting YOTA, IARU Region 2, the Americas. The YOTA summer camp will be held in August in South Africa when it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere. The weather notwithstanding, the mood was clearly upbeat. The open layout of the Xenia Fairgrounds grew compliments as attendees found it much easier to navigate than Hera Arena. The Dayton Amateur Radio Association also received kudos for their smooth management of the event. The food vendors drew rave reviews with delights ranging from standard carnival fare to ethnic cuisine. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is ARRL Audio News Extra Edition at the Dayton Hamvention. I decided to take the microphone and head outside the booth and see who I could encounter. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Bob Allison, WB1GCM, the Assistant Laboratory Manager, and we're here at Dayton Hamvention 2018. Bob, I, what are your impressions? What have you seen so far? This is Saturday and Saturday morning, but what do you think? Well, I think overall the crowds are very friendly. There's a lot of people here. There's some uh, excellent food outside. But what interests me the most uh, is some of the new equipment that's come out. Uh, looks like I'll be testing down the road. I see Kenwood uh, has come out with their TS-890S, which I'm very impressed with. Also, Yesu has come out with their FT. Uh, looks like a, was it a 101D? But it's a FT DX101D. Very sharp looking radio. ICOM, of course, has their IC7610 out. Uh, it looks top notch. And Flex has a very beautiful looking uh, 6600 and 6400. And so all of the major transceiver manufacturers have very impressive displays here. And there's, of course, lots of eye candy for everybody. And uh, all the other vendors have their best wares out. And I've enjoyed looking at what's uh, come out for accessories, amplifiers, antennas, apparel, parts, you name it. It's here at Dayton. And it's neat to see. And it's best to be with all these people who all have similar interests. And food trucks. Lots of really good food trucks. I had a BLT yesterday that was awesome. <laughs> and the day is just getting started, Bob. Yes, it is. Indeed, there will be thousands and thousands and thousands of people here. Again, all with a wide variety of backgrounds, and that's what makes amateur radio wonderful. It wasn't long after before I encountered Tony Maluzzi, KD8RTT, and I asked him to describe the Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative. So uh, the goal of the Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative is to promote amateur radio throughout colleges. Um, so to do that, we're working with 
college hams all over the country. Um, we have a Facebook group, which is pretty active, which acts as a great resource for us to discuss um, ideas and, and figure out what works, what doesn't work. Uh, so we're really focusing on just bringing the hams together, um, giving them a central meeting place, a, a hub to interact, and uh, kind of figure out how to make amateur radio more pr uh, prominent in colleges and um, increase activity. And how's it, how's it going in terms of college amateur radio stations? Are you seeing more of them becoming active thanks to the initiative? It, it certainly seems so. Um, it, you know, from what we found, there's been college clubs all over the country for a long time, but they haven't coordinated a lot in the past. So uh, we're kind of getting together now. Um, so you kind of see the same faces again and again. We also have, you know, we also chat online as a group, and sometimes we'll work out skeds and, you know, see who's on the air where and try to work each other, you know, in real time. Okay, great. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Many people don't realize that the Dayton Amateur Radio Association, the sponsors of the Dayton Hamvention, operate a special event station, W8BI, at the show. I tracked down the special event station manager and asked him a few questions. I'm speaking with John, WA5FAC, at W8BI, the special event station here at Hamvention. How's it been going? Well, the bands have been pretty bad, Steve, so uh, we have made contacts, but we haven't made as many as we anticipated originally, but we offer uh, two stations here, one on 40 meters and one on 20 meters, and what, what has been really gratifying is that people have come by, particularly the new licensees, to, uh, to test out and get on the air for the first time after they've gotten their new licensees, after they've taken their VE exam. Uh, quite a number of young people uh, we have a, a number of international people that, and, and as you can see at one of our consoles right now, we have a Japanese operator who's trying to make contact with one of his Japanese friends on the 20 meter band. Um, it's been uh, wonderful to, uh, to be available for the other people who want to get on for one reason or another with our special event station. So it's been very rewarding even though the bands haven't been very good. How many bands uh, can you access from here? We, we have an uh, antenna up that has two feeds, one on 40 meters, and then uh, 20 through 10. And uh, so it's uh, all the HF bands short of the, uh, the real low-frequency stuff. Okay, John. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Well, another hamvention is in the books. The weather on this last day is probably the best of the entire event. Skies are mostly sunny and temperatures are near 80. Despite the soggy conditions for Hamvention 2018, attendees who remember when the event was at Hera Arena were very pleased with the new venue at the Xenia Fairgrounds. There was quite a bit of positive feedback about the spacious, open layout and the way it made it easy to get around. Other than the exhibits, the forums, and flea market, another big hit was the food trucks. There was an enormous variety of food, and the quality was much higher than anyone remembers eating at Hera Arena. Like all Hamvention Sundays, attendance is down, but there are still a considerable number of people present. As Hamvention veterans will tell you, Sunday is the best day to grab last-minute bargains. After all, exhibitors would much rather turn the products into dollars than pack everything back into crates. This is Bob Inderbitson, NQ1R, the ARRL marketing manager. Bob, it's Sunday morning. What are your impressions of Hamvention? Yeah, uh, for the second year in a row at this uh, new venue, I think Hamvention did a superb job. Uh, the first year they worked through a couple of minor kinks, but my, my road trip into Hamvention each day was smooth sailing. Uh, traffic throughout the exhibit areas was great. I heard lots of positive uh, reactions about the flea market this year. Uh, it, it was great fun, of course. Uh, I, thought, uh, I thought a little bit of rain here and there didn't slow anyone down. Lots of good traffic in and out of the event. Had a great time. What are your impressions uh, about the attendance compared to last year? About the same, higher, lower? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bad judge of attendance. Uh, uh, we, we in the ARL exhibit area had a lot of people through here for much of the show. So, uh, and any time it rained a little bit outside, the attendance inside seemed to swell quite a bit. Um, I was quite pleased with the attendance. I don't know uh, what the overall attendance of the event was, but I know the line at the sausage truck was very long. What, uh, of all the... Uh the features of the expo area, was there any one in particular that seemed to be popular? 
Yeah, I think our celebration of public service communications went really well this year. Um, uh, there was a focus on uh, sort of the volunteerism that took place in the aftermath of the 2017 hurricanes. Uh, we celebrated the volunteers who put in their time and effort. We celebrated the programs that helped pull those people together. We had served agencies and partners here that did a phenomenal job uh, celebrating with us volunteerism in this nation. And uh, it was just a really, really good Good event. So I, I would say uh, seeing the volunteers from the Force of 50 who came here to have a reunion and to share their stories about the um, 2017 hurricane emergency communications effort was, was really quite exciting for me and actually quite moving as well. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. This is Scotty Cowling, WA2DFI, and he's vice president of the Tucson Amateur Packet Radio, or Tapper, better known as. And uh, we're here at the Dayton Hamvention, and uh, you've had a lot going on, and you have a lot coming up as well. Yes, and it's uh, been a great Hamvention. Seen a lot of people that we see mostly once a year. And uh, also upcoming is our Tapper DCC, which we're promoting at the Hamvention which is going to be in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on September 14th to 16th of 2018. And what's going to be going on at the DCC? DCC is uh, kind of like a turbo version of the ham forums at Hamvention. There's, uh, we run two parallel tracks. There's an intro track and there is a technical track. So if you, uh, for instance, if you have heard of APRS, but you don't really know what it's all about, you'll have an intro track on APRS likely. We'll maybe have an intro on digital modes, and then for those who are more technical, we'll have the main track, which is going to be a lot of technical presentations on things like mesh network, software-defined radio, uh, digital mode, new digital modes, uh, you name it. If it's digital and radio, then it's welcome at DCC. Is it fair to say that it's not just for the digital elite, it's for beginners as well? Yes, especially with our introductory forums, it's for beginners. and. We have a, 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 the forums, the presentations run the gamut. Some of them are very technical, with lots of math, and that's when you can go out and take a coffee break if you're not math inclined. <laughs> and if you are math inclined, then you'll enjoy that. And then there's other forums that are more uh, on the philosophical side. And like, uh, for instance, we had a couple of forum, a couple of talks this year, this past year, on how to get new people at ham radio, how to get them interested, what technical things can we do. So it was a little technical, but really there was no math, there was no higher, uh, higher science required, just kind of uh, thought-provoking presentations. And these digital communication conferences have been going on literally for decades, correct? They started out as uh, the uh, computer conference, I believe, in uh, 82, I, I, if I'm and maybe you have the date wrong by a year or so. Sounds right. Yeah, because Tapper started in 81, and so 82, 83, and they, then they kind of morphed into the Digital Communications Conference when, when packet radio, keyboard to keyboard use kind of fell off, then we're kind of going like, well, we're packet radio, what do we do? Well, there's APRS, but then there's all things digital. And so what Tapper's mission now is, is to promote R&D and promote the state of the art in anything digital and radio. Okay, and if somebody wants to attend the Digital Communications Conference, they can go to the Tapper website, www.tapr.org slash DCC. Is that correct? I believe that's right, and if uh, you just go to tapper.org, there's a button at the top that says Conferences, and you can click on that if you uh, can't remember DCC. Okay, very good. Thank you, Scott. All right, thank you. After speaking with Scotty Cowling, I ran into Joe Moulter, N8IDA. He's the president of the Westchester Amateur Radio Association, and they operate the Voice of America Museum. I asked Joe to give me some history of the famous Voice of America Bethany Relay site and how it has since been turned into a museum. It was in operation from 1944 to 1994, and the station operated six transmitters that it broadcast into Europe, the Soviet Union, South America, and northern part of Africa. It kind of sat vacant for a while, and eventually a group of people got together to create the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting. Currently, the museum is open on weekends, Saturday and Sunday, from 1 to 4. 
And at the museum, we have various areas of radio broadcasting. We have the Jack Gray collection of wireless, which covers uh, a lot of radio equipment from the real early part of radio, including spark gap, early regenerative receivers, things like that. Uh, we also have the Robert Drake collection, which consists of Drake radios that were made here in Ohio. And after Robert Drake passed away, we inherited all of his radios, which are brand new Drake radios that have never been on the air. We also have our last 250 kilowatt transmitter by the Collins Corporation that was used there to broadcast shortwave. We have the original control room that was built in the 1960s where all of the power and the audio that came in over the long line telephone lines went out to the transmitters. We also have the original switch gear which contains six rows of 23 switches that maintained all the audio going out to the antennas from the transmitters. So we had a huge antenna field that covered a, originally a square mile. Uh, most of the antennas were rhombics. And then uh, in the 1960s, they built two Sturba curtain antennas, which were up until uh, the station closed. I remember seeing those as a child. Yeah. Yes, very good. Yeah, they were quite high. And uh, they, they were directed towards uh, Europe and the Soviet Union. And then also we had uh, a number of other types of antennas that were directed for other directions. And then we also have an area in the museum now that is uh, dedicated to the history of broadcasting in Cincinnati. And then the original 1940s control room is now our ham station, where we have seven operating positions uh, for the club. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Quite welcome. Thanks for stopping by. And that's it from the 2018 Dayton Hamvention. I hope you've enjoyed it. 73s, and thanks for listening. China has launched two microsatellites into a lunar transfer orbit. They launched as secondary payloads with the Quenquiao relay satellite on May 20th in conjunction with the Chang'e 4 mission to the far side of the moon. Once in lunar orbit, DSLWPA1 and DSLWPA2, DSLWP discovering the sky at longest wavelengths pathfinder, these satellites will test low frequency radio astronomy and space based interferometry. They carry amateur radio and educational payloads, but not a transponder. The mission will be the first ever attempt at a soft landing on the far side of the moon. Following deployment, signals from the DSLWP satellites were received by radio amateurs in Brazil, Chile, and the U.S., as well as by many others around the world. Harbin Institute of Technology, BY2HIT, developed and built the DSLWP spacecraft and is overseeing that mission. The two microsats eventually will enter a 300 by 9,000 kilometer elliptical orbit. Each satellite carries VHF, UHF, SDR transceivers for beacon telemetry, telecommand, and digital image downlink, plus a GMSK JT4 repeater. Onboard transmitting power is about 2 watts. The astronomy objectives for the two spacecraft are to observe the sky at the lower end of the electromagnetic spectrum, about 1 MHz to 30 MHz, with the aim of learning about energetic phenomena from galactic sources, using the moon to shield them from earthbound radio signals. An open telecommand protocol on the spacecraft is designed to allow radio amateurs to send commands to take and download images. DSLWP A1 downlinks are 435.425 MHz and 436 decimal 425 MHz. DSLWP A2 downlinks are 435 decimal 400 MHz and 436 decimal 400 MHz. They will use 250 500 BPS GMSK using 10 kHz wide FM signal channel data with concatenated codes or JT4G. JT4 uses four tone FSK with a keying rate of 4 decimal 375 baud. The JT4G submode uses 315 Hz tone spacing 
and 1260 hertz total bandwidth. The Quenquiao communications relay satellite is required for the lunar far side landing to facilitate communication with a not yet launched lander and rover because the moon's far side never faces Earth and some significant scientific measurements from the dark side of the moon require real-time contact with Earth. Quenquiao was developed by the China Academy of Space Technology. Harbin Institute of Technology Amateur Radio Club hopes that radio amateurs will get involved with the DSLWP mission and QSL cards have been designed for different flight phases for amateurs who successfully receive telemetry or make contact. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Let me just log in here to my computer. And let's see, what is, uh, what is new in the tech world? Technology that's changing this world of ours in so many ways, so many interesting, fascinating, and sometimes scary ways. I've been reading a lot because, you know, we run a website and I have a business and some of our uh, listeners and, you, you know, consumers are in uh, the European Union. So I've been reading a lot about this new GDPR that goes into effect on Friday, the General Protection, General Data Protection Regulation. And uh, it's it's one of those things that happens as a, uh, you see this all the time, where a government, uh, or in this case, the, the combined governments of the European Union will promulgate a, a rule, a regulation, and then everybody ignores it. They had a uh, they had a privacy regulation and everybody ignored it. It was uh, you know, you know, oh yeah, well, yeah, sure, cuz it didn't have any teeth. So they said, "Well, let's give it some teeth." And they did. The maximum fine is the higher of 20 million euros or 4% of your global revenue. So for <laughs> for a big company, that would be a ton of money. And it's part of, so anyway, it goes in effect on uh, Friday. You probably already are getting uh, emails and messages from companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter saying, hey, we're changing our privacy policies. That's one thing you'll see right away. People's privacy policies will change. They may change some of the ways they handle your data, which is a good thing. Companies have 72 hours, for instance, to notify you if there's been a breach and your data has leaked out. That's great. I like that. They have to give you the right to any, they, let, they first of all, they have to tell you what personal data of yours they collect and then give you the right to have it deleted. At first, uh, Facebook, we thought maybe would just make this available to members of the uh, EU, people who live in Europe. But no, they're making it available worldwide. Maybe you've seen it. You can download all the data that Facebook has about you and you can request that they, they, they delete it. Couldn't you didn't used to be able to do that before. So that's all good. There is kind of this terrified hysteria about uh about you know oh my goodness what's going to happen and i think uh, cooler heads are saying it's it, so if you run a business as i do are saying that it's not time to panic you'll get a warning you'll get uh, and you'll have a chance to comply and you know it's not going to be the end of the world because you know if you have a website for instance you do collect information about people you collect their internet address at the very least every time they visit you and you might collect more so you have to think about that and how how you can delete it or maybe and this might be the beneficial outcome of this. Just collect less. We, you know, by default, websites collect all this information, just because it's it's built in. But you can turn it off, and maybe people will start collecting less. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. This is all part of something that's going on in the last few years. It's kind of interesting. If you're going to see it tonight on 60 Minutes, they're doing a a, a big investigative piece on the power of Google. In fact, uh, Google stock went down on Friday when. <laughs> People thought eh, this could be bad. This could be bad, uh, but it's not. Uh, you know, it's just that people are starting to pay attention to the kinds of information companies like Facebook and Google are gathering about us. They're kind of saying maybe maybe they ought to, there ought to be some controls on them. Should should uh, Google be accountable? Should we should mostly? I think people want to know what is it you're collecting and what are you doing with it. And that's uh, I think it's fair for Google to get some attention. 60 Minutes interviews a bunch of uh, critics of Google. You know, if you're successful, there's going to be critics. <laughs> if you, a bunch of critics of Google, uh, some of whom say they're, you know, it stifles competition. They interview uh, the woman who is uh, in charge of GDPR, Margarita Vestager. She is the 
She's in the uh, EC, the uh, EU Competition Commissioner. Google fined, uh, Google was fined by uh, her uh, and uh, the EU $2.7 billion last year and probably faces more investigation, as does Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg is scheduled to testify before them. And it's important. Companies aren't going to turn off the spigot to Europe. So they need to figure it out. If you, if you, if you operate in a country, uh, you got to follow the laws of the country. Your only choice is to not, to, not to flout the law, but just not to be in that country. So some people are saying Apple should do. You know, Apple uh, loves the Chinese market. It's the only way they can grow the iPhone sales because every <laughs> they've saturated the market in the West. But, but in India or, and China, where there are many, many consumers who don't yet have iPhones, can't afford iPhones yet, this is a big opportunity for Apple. But the Chinese government keeps asking Apple to do things that, I don't know, make me a little bit queasy. For instance, they're... They're uh, now pulling all the apps. First, they pulled last year all the apps that supported virtual private networks because people in China could use them to surf the net without being surveilled by the Chinese government. Now they're cracking down on something on, on applications that have something built in called Call Kit. They can't offer it in China because it's encrypted. It allows Chinese citizens to make private phone calls. And uh, Apple has decided, you know, Google when Google was kind of faced with this, they just pulled out of China. They said, all right, well, we don't have to do business there. Apple really wants to be in China. And so they've basically, they're complying with Chinese laws. And uh, it's a slippery slope, isn't it? Apple, you know, says they fight hard for our privacy in the in the U.S. But when it comes to China, nah, not, so, not so much. And it's only a matter of time before the Chinese government comes to Apple, as they did to Yahoo and said, they went to Yahoo and they said, we, we want the names and addresses of these dissidents. They're using Yahoo Mail. And Yahoo handed it over, and those distance went to jail. How long before Apple's asked to do something like that? Hmm. And then what will they do? And then what will they do? You see, tech is a complicated thing. There's lots to talk about. Uh, let's see. What else is uh, in the news? No, this will be the one, <laughs> the one place there will be no royal wedding talk. Did you get up? In California, it was uh, 4 a.m., so... I, I don't know why. I just, I, I was, I'm talking about it. Not allowed, huh? I wasn't, uh, I, I don't think I was aware that it was going on, but I woke up and I looked at the Twitter and then I was aware. Holy cow! The Twitter is made for that kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. That's how I, you know, what, do you use Twitter? Do you, I mean, I think really it's a, it, uh, it isn't, it's, a, what was the number? I think they have 300 million active users. That sounds like a lot, but that's globally. I always get the sense that Twitter is something that the tech community is very aware of. And everybody knows, you know, the name Twitter. American Idol uses it, or was it The Voice? Somebody uses it for voting and stuff. So it's you see it all the time. But I think my sense is when I talk to real people, they go, yeah, I don't I don't use that. It's a it's it's kind of it's become over time kind of some sort of nervous system for the internet. Like the, um, it's kind of like uh, the jungle drumbeat or the, I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not coherent, but you can go and look at it and in a few seconds, get a sense of what everybody's talking about. Like this week, it was uh, Yanny and Laurel. Did you, did you, did, see, I feel like people are, are making this stuff up just because they, <laughs> they, it's like, oh, it's been a year since the red dress, red, green, blue, gold dress. It's time for another one. And they just, I feel like they're playing us. Or maybe they're playing Twitter and thereby playing us. <laughs> I, 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 I pledged to myself that I would not talk about the royal wedding or Yanni and Laurel this week. And I've done both now. I, I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> I, I don't know what came over me. I don't. I, I'm sorry. Let's see. There must be something uh, fascinating we can talk about. Something exciting in tech. The Google Google has uh, there's a leak that Google is working on new augmented reality glasses. You you know what augmented reality is? It's not virtual reality. The virtual reality is when you put those visors on and you don't you can't the world goes away and you're looking at a 3D world that you can look around in. You can't yet walk around in, but you can look around in and kind of interact as if you're in that world. But it's not. Mm, it's a little queasy making because your 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 brain knows your body knows I'm yeah, not really in that world. I'm kind of in some other world, and you get a little in this little queasy making. 
Augmented reality is you superimposing computer display on top of the world you're seeing. So you're looking through glasses, they're like sunglasses, but you're seeing on top of the world other stuff, additional stuff, information. And I think that that's actually the most exciting of the two. I really feel like that's where things are going to start to happen, is in augmented reality. So Google maybe was the first off the block with something like augmented reality with Google Glass. Remember what a flop that was because you looked like such a dork. People got beat up in San Francisco for wearing Google Glass. They, guy walks into a bar. Sounds like a joke. Guy walks into a bar wearing Google Glass and they go, get out of here. And then they and then beat him up. That's how bad it got for Google Glass. Then Microsoft has come along with something they call HoloLens. They call it mixed reality. Actually, that might be a better one than augmented. They're, they're kind of the same thing. Mixed reality is a mix of real reality and augmented reality together at last in your eyes. I think there are going to be some challenges with this. Apple, Tim, Tim Cook, the CEO at Apple, has been talking a lot about, oh, it's going to be the next big thing. But now here's this uh, rumor from, uh, from CNET. Actually, it came from originally from a German news site. But I don't read German, so I'm going to give CNET credit for translating. Winfuture.de. They say they have documents that say Google is working with a, a Taiwanese manufacturer called Quanta on a headset. That's kind of interesting because if they're working with a manufacturer, it sounds like they want to make it in quantity, called the A65. It, uh, it has a, uh, a, a specialized Qualcomm chip in it, supports very high resolution images, video capture as well as display, 3D overlays, supports all the all the 3D protocols that programmers want, Vulkan, OpenGL, OpenCL. It has built-in wireless Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 5.1, built-in GPS. You know, this would be interesting because right now, if you get a Microsoft HoloLens, you have to, you're connected to the, a big computer through a giant cable. This, because of its Qualcomm chip, would be standalone. You'd be walking around. I have to say, though, Google, if you are doing this, consider what you look like wearing them. So Google traditionally has not. <laughs> That's part of the problem with Google Glass. They're geeks. They say, oh, you can walk around with a little little screen over your eyebrow, a little camera on the side, a little red light blinking. You could do that. Get beat up in a bar. Sure you can. They, who, who, <laughs> no big deal. So maybe it's funny because if you want to be an early adopter in this kind of stuff, somebody who uses this stuff before anybody else, you're going you're gonna to suffer the slings and arrows of uh, tech hate. I was in San Francisco. What, boy, has that city changed. I was in San Francisco on uh, Friday. Uh, it, was a, it was a reunion of the, the uh, tech channel I used to work for, Tech TV, which was started 20 years ago. 20 years ago, this May 11th, a week uh, and a few days ago. And um, it, when I first got the invitation, I saw, oh, it's in the Tenderloin on Jones Street, which is normal, was used to be anyway, kind of a divey area where a what drug addicts would would hang out. It wasn't a it wasn't a very nice part of. That's why it was called the Tenderloin. It wasn't a very nice part of San Francisco. So I'm expecting. Oh, this can be kind of a dive bar. No, completely gentrified. I was I was with a coworker, Jerry, and he says, No, no, no. Look, look at the building. It's all got up lighting on it. This is no. <laughs> this is not. This is not the the old Tenderloin. This is the new San Francisco which has become completely transformed. You can't afford to live there because it's now we hear Facebook has just leased 14 floors in a building down by the waterfront. It's uh this is uh it's it's really interesting to see the entire face of a city change, completely change. San Francisco is no longer the city uh, I used to live in. It is has become gentrified doesn't even say it. It's become geekified. It's become silicon valleyized. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. CQ Magazine has announced the 2018 inductees to its Amateur Radio DX and Contest Hall of Fame. The CQ Amateur Radio Hall of Fame added 11 new members for 2018, bringing to 321 the total number of inductees since its establishment in 2001. The CQ Amateur Radio Hall of Fame honors individuals who have made significant contributions to amateur radio, as well as radio amateurs who have made significant contributions to amateur radio, to their professional careers, 
or to some other aspect of life on our planet. The 2018 inductees are Marlon Brando, Fox 05 GJ, iconic movie actor, David Brown, KC5ZTC, NASA astronaut killed in the 2003 Columbia disaster, Calpena KC Charla, KD5ESI, NASA astronaut killed in the 2003 Columbia disaster, and Laura Clark, KC5ZSU, NASA astronaut killed in the 2003 Columbia disaster. Ashar Farhan, VU2ESE, pioneer in popularizing open source BIDX semi kits using Arduinos for affordable low power transceivers. And Grady Fox, W4FRM, single sideband pioneer, worked on Manhattan Project during World War II in the camera for NASA's lunar landers. Wendell King, X2ADD, African American pioneer of broadcasting and college radio. Fred Lloyd, AA7BQ, founder of QRZ.com, the most widely accessed amateur radio website. And Mark Piken, KC9X, slash VE3QAM, wireless communication and networking pioneer, inventor, and cybersecurity expert. And Carol Perry, WB2MGP, longtime advocate for youth and amateur radio, and the moderator of the Hamvention Youth Forum for more than 30 years. And finally, Ed Westcott, W4UVS, photographer who chronicled the Manhattan Project during World War II and later helped the FBI with its investigation into the Jonestown mass suicide and murder. CQ announced the induction of two new members to its CQ DX Hall of Fame, which honors those DXers who not only excel in personal performance, but also give back to the hobby in outstanding ways. CQ DX editor Bob Shank, N2OO, presented Hall of Fame plaques at an induction ceremony held at the annual Dayton DX Dinner on May 18th. The 2018 inductees to the CQ DX Hall of Fame are Kimo Chun, KH7U, nominated by the Dateline DX Association, of which he is a founding member. Chun has also operated on many major D-expeditions, including Kingman Reef, Christmas Island, Palmyra Atoll, Cambodia, and Midway Island. In addition, he routinely provides logistical assistance to HAMS planning Pacific Island D-expeditions, and he provides electronic maintenance support for groups administering Pacific Island nature preserves, including the Nature Conservancy and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. A longtime member of Hawaii's Department of Emergency Management RACES team, Chun recently featured an NBC News story about last year's accidental nuclear attack alert message sent out in Hawaii, in which he emphasized the role played by amateurs as the first to alert the public that the message was sent in error. Krasimir Petkov, K1LZ slash LZ1SA, nominated by the Arukaria DX Group of Brazil, the Bulgarian Federation of Radio Amateurs, and the Yankee Clipper Contest Club, Petkov has made many behind-the-scenes contributions to DXing and contesting over the years. A veteran of two dozen D expeditions, he's also provided or arranged financial and or materiel support to many others. He co-founded the Young Ham Contest Program in 2003, taking hams under the age of 21 to operate in major contests from Caribbean superstations, and he served on the board of the 2006 World Radio Sport Team, the championship competitions held in Brazil. He's also worked with fellow DXers during D-Expeditions to promote amateur radio and provide equipment for hams in countries in which the groups have operated. Established in 1967, the CQ DX Hall of Fame recognizes radio amateurs who have made major contributions to DXing and de-expeditioning. This year's inductions bring the total number of members to the CQ DX Hall of Fame to 73. CQ Magazine has announced the induction of two new members to the CQ Contest Hall of Fame, which honors contesters who stand out in their own contesting performance while also contributing greatly to the avocation as a whole. CQ Contesting Editor David Siddall, K3ZJ, presented Hall of Fame plaques at an induction ceremony held at the annual Dayton Contest Dinner on May 19th. The 2018 inductees to the CQ Contest Hall of Fame are Andy Blank, N2NT, Nominated by the Frankfurt Radio Club, Blank has been the director of the CQ Worldwide 160-meter DX contest for the past decade. A world-class contester with wins stretching back to 1979, he has competed in five World Radio Sport Team Championship events and was director of competition for WRTC 2014 held in Massachusetts. 
He is also a member of the advisory board of the Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation. Tom Wagner, N1MM, nominated by both the Yankee Clipper Contest Club and the Northern California Contest Club, Wagner is best known for his role in developing and maintaining ongoing upgrades to N1MM Logger Plus, the world's most popular contest logging software. The program supports more than 240 different contests, multiple operating modes, and integration with any number of transceivers and station accessories. He now leads a team of developers developing further enhancements who were recognized with the Yasmi Foundation Excellence Award in 2015. The CQ Contest Hall of Fame was established in 1986 to recognize those amateurs who have made major contributions to the art of radio contesting. This year's inductions bring the total number of members of the CQ Contest Hall of Fame to 71. On June 23rd and 24th, Amateur Radio will celebrate Field Day 2018. This is Ham Radio's open house, featuring demonstrations of the science, skills, and service that is Amateur Radio. Hams from across North America will hold local Field Day events to display the array of equipment and technologies they use for public service and community outreach. For more info, visit ARRL.org slash Field Dash Day. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio International. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, May 25th. There is a single sunspot in view right now that appears to be growing and an even more active group just rotating into view. Together, they increase the chance of solar flares and they also increase the solar flux index. As the index rises, conditions on the HF bands tend to improve. As a result, conditions on 20 meters and above may get significantly better over the weekend. There is yet another blast of solar wind coming our way, but the forecast is only for about a 30 to 40 percent chance of geomagnetic storms. On VHF and UHF, there have been a number of two-meter band openings popping up in Southern California, the Upper Midwest, and the Southeast. The first science results from the Solar Eclipse QSO Party, or SEQP, last August 21st have been published in the American Geophysical Union Journal, Geophysical Research Letters. In the paper, Modeling Amateur Radio Soundings of the Ionospheric Response to the 2017 Great American Eclipse by Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, presented reverse beacon network observations of the SEQP and compared them with ray tracings through an eclipse version of the physical based ionospheric model. Frizzell, a New Jersey Institute of Technology research professor, explains that ray tracing is a method of calculating where a radio wave will go based on electron density. HAMSI, the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation Organization, sponsored the event. On 20 meters, eclipse effects were observed as a drop-off in communications for an hour before and an hour after eclipse maximum. On 40 meters, typical path lengths extended from about 500 kilometers, 310 miles, to 1,000 kilometers, or 620 miles, for 45 minutes before and after eclipse maximum. On 160 meters and 80 meters, eclipse effects were observed as band openings 20 to 45 minutes around eclipse maximum. These observations suggest an eclipse-induced weakening of the ionosphere and are consistent with numerous prior HF radio eclipse ionospheric studies. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Welcome to the Ancient Amateur Archives. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. 
If there was a buzzword to describe amateur radio in the first three months of 1958, it was satellite. The Russians had launched Sputnik in November 1957. Thousands of hams tuned in the weak beacon from the satellite on 20 and 40 megacycles. Amateur radio received a lot of publicity as, across the nation, many local papers ran articles on the hometown hams and the signals from space. Many amateur operators were also busy building converters for 108 megacycles as the U.S. Army Signal Engineering Labs in Fort Mammoth, New Jersey had a 50 kilowatt transmitter on that frequency to bounce signals off the moon. The antenna was a 60-foot dish. Those lucky enough to hear it received a special QSL. Also on 108 megacycles was the first U.S. satellite, Explorer, launched in February 1958. Hundreds of reports were received by the ARRL from those who heard it. Amateur radio was growing in 1958. The total number of hams was over 160,000, three times the number of 1945, with predictions that we would go over 200,000 by 1960. ARRL membership was also at its highest ever, 60,000. In fact, there were so many hams, the FCC was running out of call signs. The traditional 1 by 3 calls beginning with K or W were almost completely used up, especially in the 2nd and 6th call areas. To alleviate the problem, the FCC began the 2 by 3 format. Henceforth, new technician, general, and extra class call signs would begin with WA, while novices would get WV. The large growth in the number of licenses was partially due to the popularity of the novice and technician class. Novices had 50 kilocycles on both 80 and 40 meters, a full 150 kilocycles on 15, and voice privileges on the 145 to 147 megacycle segment of 2 meters. The technician class license, which had started out with only 220 megacycles and above, had been given 6 meters in 1955. With the sunspots at their peak in 1958, thousands of novices and technicians were on 15 and 6, working worldwide DX and getting worked all continents, worked all states, and even DXCC awards. This upset some higher class licensees, some of whom demanded a reduction in the number of frequencies available to the novice and technician. No frequencies were taken away, however, the ARRL went on record as being against giving technicians any two-meter privileges. It wasn't until the 1970s that technicians would finally get the full two-meter band. Early in the year, the ARRL filed a strong opposition to a proposal to remove amateurs from the 11-meter band and establish a citizen's radio service there. Granted, the band was lightly used by hams, it wasn't a worldwide allocation, and there was interference from industrial, scientific, and medical devices on 27.12 megacycles. Still, it was our band, and the ARRL made a good argument for keeping it. The FCC was expected to make a decision by the summer. In technical developments, Slow Scan TV was first described in the August 1958 issue of QST. Transistors were coming out of the purely experimental stage and were starting to show up in practical circuits. There were several all-transistor power supply and modulator projects and even a transistorized 10-meter walkie-talkie. Mandatory in any 1958 amateur base station was a broadcast band receiver. Why? In a word, Conelrad. Conelrad was the predecessor to the emergency broadcast system. It used key stations which would broadcast emergency messages on 640 or 1240 kilocycles. Every amateur station had a monitor 640 or 1240 KC while on the air. Mobile operators in contact with a base station did not have to monitor Conelrad. Speaking of mobile, do you want to try it? Just remember these simple 1958 FCC rules. Quote, Notices are required to the FCC engineer in charge of the districts wherein the mobile or portable operation is contemplated when such operation shall be in excess of 48 hours without return to the home address. Also, 
Please remember to include the portable location or mobile itinerary, the dates of the beginning and end of each period of operation away from the home, and the registry or license number of the vessel, vehicle, or aircraft from which mobile operation is to occur." Unquote. Simple. Got that? Now, if you still want to try mobile, then consider the new Collins KWM-1 mobile transceiver. It is a 175 watt input SSB CW rig which covers the 20, 15, 11, and 10 meter bands. You can get it for only $695, $1958. Let's take a look at the other 1958 rigs out there. Halicrafters had several receivers. The SX99 at $150, the SX100 for $295 and the SX101 at $395. On the transmitter side there was the HT32 a 144 watt input AM sideband CW unit which covered the 80, 40, 20, 15, 11 and 10 meter bands for $675. Johnson Viking transmitters ranged in price from $55 for a basic CW kit to $950 for a 600 watt sideband AM CW assembled unit. You can choose a good companion receiver from Hammerland from the HQ100 $170 to the HQ150 $294 to the all new HQ160 $379. For VHF operators the Gonset Communicator 3 an AM rig for 6 or 2 meters was introduced at $275. It was civil defense approved, of course. Clegg had the model 62T10, a 2, 6, and 10 meter transmitter. On the budget side, perfect for the novice, was the new national NC60 general coverage receiver for $60. Heathkit, of course, had some excellent bargains from the DX20 CW rig, only $35, to the DX40, a 75 watt AM CW rig for 80 through 10 meters, including 11 meters, at $65, to a general coverage receiver for only $30. All of the above were kits, of course. Now, how many Radio Shack stores were there in 1958? Two. Boston, Massachusetts? and New Haven, Connecticut. Now, Radio Shack had a six transistor portable radio for only $29.95, which was perfect for monitoring Conrad. But the big news in 1958 came from Collins. Late in the year, they introduced the S line of equipment. Collins took out glorious, exquisite, multi-page, full-color ads in QST to show off the 32S1 transmitter the 75 S1 receiver, and the 30 S1 linear amplifier. A new standard had been set in amateur radio, and sideband was here to stay. On September 11, 1958, the FCC came to a decision. Our 11-meter band would be removed from us and turned over to the new Class C and Class D citizens band. A new concept was developing that access to the airwaves should be made available to individuals for non-technical, non-hobby, personal communications. It was the dawn of a new era. In our next installment, we'll look at amateur radio in the early 1960s. I hope you will join me. Your time is up. Go in peace. But return again for our next installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. So just what is ham sci? I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, with the first excerpt from the 2018 Dayton Hamvention Forums. We begin with a Tapper Forum talk about Ham Psi, the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation. The forum moderator was Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Nathaniel Frizzell. I'm W2NAF, and I'm a research professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology, and I am the main person behind starting HamSci, along with a few other people. So what is HamSci? HamSci is a ham radio science citizen investigation. And we're an organization, although that's kind of a loose term, we're, we're more of a website and a, a listserv, but we have a number of main objectives, and that's to advance scientific research and understanding through ham radio. It's to encourage the development of new technologies to support this research. And that's where having HamSci work with Tapper is really good because Tapper is very good at developing new ideas and really implementing them. And we also want to look to provide educational opportunities for the amateur radio community and the general public. I really became what I am today because of ham radio. I started in like eighth grade and I just followed it straight through and it led me to where I am now. So once I became a graduate student and I, I was working toward my PhD, I really saw this neat place where we could join the scientific research I was doing in school with the whole ham radio community. We now have many different people who are part of HamSci. We have a Google group, which if you're interested in joining, you can come talk to me and I can add you to that. And we have members from just institutes and universities all over the world. And we also include just members of the general amateur radio community can participate. And so what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to show you a number of slides from different projects that other people are working on and also some of the things that I'm working on. So there's a little bit of a, a combination. It's kind of like a smorgasbord of activities. So one thing we have, this is from Bill Engelke, AB4EJ. Uh, he's at the University of Alabama and you might know his website, uh, the DX Display. And so what he's doing is he's aggregating uh, reverse beacon network, WhisperNet, PSK reporter spots, all into a single database. I've started talking with him and he's now incorporating space physics indices from the NASA Omni data set so we can start combining this into what we call the HARC database, the HamSci Amateur Radio Communications database, so we can start doing data analytics and trying to understand all of this. So that's Bill Engelke's work. Joe Dezekiewicz, K1YOW, he has been working on looking at uh, six meter spots and he's been trying to understand the relationship between uh, weather systems, especially like upper level lows and low pressure systems and the sporadic E and he's finding good relationships there. He had a really good article in the December 2017 QST, so you can read about that. And now he's been working on some new observations looking at how sporadic E forms on the jet stream and looking at correlations there. One of my friends up in uh, Canada at the University of Calgary, Gareth Perry, and he's not a ham yet, we're still working on him, but he's a researcher like myself, and he has access to this satellite known as Cassiope, and it has an HF receiver on it. So a couple years ago, we had the satellite listen to the HF bands during field day, and he's been doing some research with that. So we have a spectrogram like a waterfall display that came off of the satellite HF, and then a time series plot of that, and you can read K9 ESV field day right in there. And he actually started looking at some of the oscillations that ride on top of the CW that people were transmitting, and he was able to relate that to some physical processes in the ionosphere. And so this paper is currently under review in radio science right now. So hopefully this will come out. And it's really neat that we're starting to see peer-reviewed scientific publications come out of looking at the ham radio observations. John Ackerman talked a little bit about the personal space weather station. This is still just an idea right now. It's not like developed. But the idea is in space weather, we use tools like magnetometers and radar systems and radio receivers to try and understand what's happening out in space. And so can we develop a single personal package that you could set up in your backyard that would sense many of these different things and help contribute to understanding global space weather through your individual measurements. Kind of like you can go by a personal terrestrial weather station right now, tropospheric station, and you can plug that in and send your observations to weather underground. You get both an idea of what's happening at your location and also contribute to a bigger database. You're listening to an excerpt from the Tapper Forum given Saturday morning during the 2018 Dayton Hamvention.
The topic was Ham Psy, the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, a major mover and shaker in advanced scientific research and understanding through amateur radio activities. We'll conclude our excerpt from this brief presentation about Ham Psy by Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, in a moment. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. This is something that we're looking at developing right now. It's still just an idea. So if you have ideas to contribute to that, you know, let us know. We had the eclipse. So John just talked all about his wideband observations of the eclipse. We have been also doing other sorts of observations for the eclipse. This is from Magda Moses, KM4EGE. She's a student, also one of the people who, is, who helped start HamSci. This is observations from the Super Darn Radar in Oregon. A super darn radar is a high frequency radar. It transmits between 8 and 20 megahertz, generally outside of the hand bands. It will look for ionospheric irregularities and also look for ground scatter, and you can get ionospheric measurements from that. And so with these observations, she's starting to look at how the eclipse affected the HF spectrum using these research radar systems. And you can see a change in range of the radar scatter here during the eclipse. And she's starting to use ray tracing programs to help model that. And of course, I coordinated the solar eclipse QSO party. I really wanted to do this because I had been looking at the reverse beacon network data for a while, and I've seen a few other QSO parties, but I really wanted to see if we could make, some, make a scientific experiment that really felt kind of like a ham radio contest. I always enjoy contesting, and many other people do too. And so that's what we did. So this is a map of the reverse beacon network observations. All of the color-coded points are halfway points between a transmitter, like you out in the field, and a reverse beacon network receiver, which is a star. So all the black dots are transmitters, and there's 1,184 transmitters on this map, and 49 RBN receivers, and over 312,000 RBN midpoints there. So it's a tremendously large data set of around the eight hour period of the solar eclipse QSO party. I plotted this out and then I organized the data so that we could see how the bands change relative to time before and after the eclipse. It's a lot of what you'd expect. It's very consistent with previous experiments, but here's 20 meters on top. This is an hour and a half before the eclipse. This is an hour and a half after the eclipse. And then right down the middle is where eclipse maximum was at any particular location. And you can see 20 meters was going gangbusters an hour and a half to a half hour before the eclipse. And then things just died off. And then it came back about a half hour after the uh, maximum eclipse ended. Uh, 40 meters, you expect things to start going long in the evenings as you get into gray line propagation. That's what we saw here too. So we had good propagation before the eclipse, an hour and a half before. As the eclipse comes on, you see the typical distance of QSOs go from about 500 kilometers to about 1,000 kilometers. And then when the eclipse goes away, then we get the communications come back into about a 500 kilometer typical range for your 40 meter communications. For both 80 and 160 meters, we saw a band opening. 80 meters was opened first. It opened up about a half hour before to about a half hour after eclipse maximum. And 160 meters, that opened up about 15 minutes before and ended about 15 minutes after. So we really get from this large data set, we're able to condense those observations down and see some really nice things. So I'm very happy to say that just this past week, these SEQP observations I just showed you were accepted into geophysical research letters. It's a peer-reviewed journal well known in the ionospheric community. And so this is published open access. So you can go to hamsci.org, you can get the link, and you can download and read this paper and see all those figures yourself. So this is really exciting. I think this is really nice showing of where we're actually taking the amateur radio observations and really starting to publish and push science forward. And that concludes our excerpt from the 2018 Dayton Hamvention Tapper Forum, voiced by Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF. 
the main force behind ham Sci, the ham radio science citizen investigation a group of scientists and hams working together to achieve advanced scientific research and understanding through amateur radio activities to learn more about ham Sci, check out their website hamsci.org that's h-a-m-s-c-i dot o-r-g <laughs> Produced by amateurs, for amateurs, and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Five new ARRL section managers have been declared elected to begin their first terms of office on July 1st. Section manager election ballots were counted in the Indiana and Northern Florida sections on May 22nd at ARRL headquarters. Other candidates faced no opposition during the spring election cycle. In Indiana, James Jimmy Mary, KC9RPX of Ellettsville, was declared elected in a very close race with Brian G. Jenks, WB9BGJ, the Indiana section traffic manager. Mary received 451 votes, and Jenks of Fort Wayne received 438 votes. Mary has been the affiliated club coordinator in Indiana since 2005 and is presently serving a fifth term as president of the Bloomington Amateur Radio Club. Incumbent Indiana section manager Brent Walls, N9BA, decided not to run for another term after helming the Indiana field organization since July 2016. In northern Florida, Kevin Bess, KK4BFN, outpolled Scott Roberts, KK4ECR, 564 to 447, to succeed current section manager Steve Zabo, WB4OMM. Bess of Edgewater is a northern Florida assistant section manager and a member of the Daytona Beach CERT amateur radio team and of the Florida Contest Group. Zabo opted not to run for a third term of office after serving since July 2014. Oregon also will get a new section manager this summer. David Kidd, KA7OZO of Oregon City, was the sole candidate for the post. He has been an emergency coordinator and assistant section emergency coordinator. Kidd will take the reins of the Oregon section from John Kaur, KX7YT of Portland, who did not run for a new term after serving for the past two years. In the East Bay section, Jim Siemens, W6LK, will begin an 18-month term as section manager on July 1st. Because no candidates were nominated by the September 8, 2017 deadline, nominations were resolicited. Siemens of Walnut Creek, California, was the only nominee to succeed incumbent section manager Jim Latham, AF6AQ of Livermore, who has served as East Bay section manager since 2008 and did not run for a new term. In New Mexico, Bill Mater, K8TE of Rio Rancho, will become the new section manager there in July. He too was the only candidate after nominations had to be resolicited, and he will serve an 18-month term. He follows incumbent section manager Ed James, KA8JMW of Edgewood, who did not run again after serving since 2015. Several incumbent section managers were unopposed for new two-year terms starting on July 1st. They are Ron Morgan, 89I, Illinois, Jim Crowley, K1NIT, Maine, Jim Kvachik, K8JK, Michigan, Paul Gayet, AA1SU, Vermont, and Patrick Moretti, KA1RB, Wisconsin. Princess Electra Marconi has been invited to take part in a May 31st ham radio contact with Newfoundland during a visit to Cape Cod National Seashore. The contact will be between KM1CC on the Cape and VO1AA at the Society of Newfoundland Radio Amateurs Club in St. John's, Newfoundland. KM1CC trustee Barbara Dugan, N1NS, told ARRL, quote, Chris Hillier, 
VO1IDX will serve as the net controller, so a few members can call into the princess. Someone from KM1CC will stay on the air with VO1AA should the princess need to depart. Then after, KM1CC can take calls from others should anyone want to make contact with KM1CC in grid FN51." Unquote. The plan is to use 14.22 MHz SSB on or around 1645 to 1700 UTC. It was at St. John's in 1901 that Guglielmo Marconi, using a kite-supported antenna, received the letter S from his station in Poldu, Cornwall. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Foundations of Amateur Radio With computers becoming more and more ensconced within the confines of our radio shack, the variety of information available is increasing regularly. The introduction of a waterfall display has dramatically simplified the process of detecting what the activity level is on a particular band. If you've never seen a waterfall display, it's often a real-time or nearly real-time display of radio activity. Leaving aside the mechanics of how this comes about or how much you see, Generally, it's presented as a picture that changes over time. In reality, it's a very compact way of showing a lot of information. You can think of it as a chart showing the horizontal axis as frequency, the vertical axis as time, and the color as signal strength. So as you look from left to right, you'll look at higher and higher frequencies. For example, the left side might be 7 MHz and the right side might be 7.3 MHz. Halfway along is 7.150 MHz. Similarly, now, as in zero seconds ago, is at the top of the chart, and one minute ago is lower. Depending on how fast you've set it to update, the whole screen might represent 10 seconds, 10 minutes, or 10 hours of information. Entirely flexible, entirely configurable, entirely arbitrary. If you think of the color black as having no signal strength and the color red being maximum signal strength, then the brighter the colors, the more signal there is. A Morse code signal might turn up as a series of dits and dars running down the screen, with the oldest one being at the bottom and the newest one at the top. An AM signal might show up as a thick line with a bright color, that's a high signal strength in the middle, and lighter colors or low signal strength towards the edges. Every mode has its own visual characteristics, and there are even modes that allow you to read information within a waterfall display. One of the other things you'll see in a waterfall display is strange artifacts, things like a diagonal line, for example. If you think of what a diagonal line represents as a radio signal, it's something that has a strong signal at a particular time and frequency. A moment later, it's changed frequency, and a moment later, it's done it again. The steepness of the line is dependent on two things, the speed that the frequency changes and the speed that the waterfall is updating. Before waterfall displays, the way you'd experience such a signal would be something that flashes up as a low to high swoop, or a high to low swoop depending on your listening mode and the direction of the frequency change. So what is that signal? Well, it's likely to be something called an ionospheric sounder. It does what you think it does, ping the ionosphere across multiple frequencies. The station doing this is listening for a return echo to see if the ionosphere is reflective for that particular frequency at that particular moment. The information can be used to create a map of what the ionosphere is doing right now, which in turn is used to figure out what frequency to use to make a contact. I should also mention that there is a signal identification wiki, which shows and plays various identified and unidentified radio signals. Hours of fun for the family. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. This is a busy time of the year for rovers. Get your satellite equipment ready because there are some really good ones planned. Hams in Mexico from the Radio Club Cancun are active now and until June 1st operating a 6 Echo 5 Romeo Mike from Cozumel Island. Listen for them on 80 through 6 meters and satellites, QSL via XE3N. Wyatt, AC0RA and Clayton, W5PFG. 
We're planning to be in Venice, Louisiana in Ecolima 58 for the Memorial Day weekend. Mother Nature put an end to that with a tropical storm heading that way. They have rescheduled their trip for June 7th through the 9th. They will be operating on six meters and almost all the satellites. This grid is almost 100% water and very rare for both six meter and satellite. Ken VE3HLS is getting close to retiring and leaving Canada. Before he does, he wants to take a rover trip from June 15th through the 17th and hit FN14, FN15, FN24 and 25, FN35 and 36, FN46 and 47, FN57 and 58, and FN59 and 69. An awesome set of grids for his last hurrah. Hope you can catch one of the grids you need. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO, the ARRL and the Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network, or Saturn, today renewed the Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, between the two organizations that spells out how they will work together in disaster and emergency responses. Here now with more detail on that story is Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from League Headquarters. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, signed the MOU on behalf of ARRL on Hamvention's opening day. Saturn National Liaison Bill Feist, WB8BZH, represented Saturn at the signing and delivered a copy of the MOU already signed by the Salvation Army. ARRL Emergency Preparedness Manager Mike Corey, KI1U, said ARRL and Saturn have enjoyed a formal working relationship since 1976 and that the MOU is up for renewal. The MOU defines the partnership between ARRL and Saturn and the Salvation Army, in which ARRL and Saturn agree to work together toward common goals, particularly in disaster responses. Saturn meets regularly on 14.265 MHz SSB and is activated for extended periods during disaster and emergency responses. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. We spent the last year fine-tuning, updating, revising it, and got the green light last week to do the signing here at Hamvention, Corey said. It's a fitting time for the Salvation Army and Saturn as Saturn is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, so it was a double celebration for them. Corey said Feist was closely involved in the amateur radio response last fall and the wake of the devastating Caribbean hurricanes. Corey said ARRL and Saturn also have agreed to coordinate their disaster response activities to eliminate duplication of effort. We had an effective and coordinated amateur radio response in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands last fall, Corey said. The subject of cooperation was the focus of an ARRL Hamvention forum, Building Partnerships. Leading the discussion were Corey and FEMA Community Partnership Specialist Sarah Byrne. More than 100 interested radio amateurs attended. Byrne outlined the four C's of partnership, collaboration, communication, cooperation, and coordination. Corey reminded those attending the forum that partnerships are only as good as the people participating in them. It can often come down to one person and how they interact with the group, he said. To illustrate their points, Corey and Byrne called up three volunteers from the audience and gave each a scenario that required a partnership to achieve. The volunteers then picked three more volunteers as partners. After a few minutes of intense discussions, the new partners outlined what resources they had determined were available to them and what the next steps were in this partnership was to go forward to achieve its objectives. Successful partnerships don't always mean that everything went right, Corey reminded the audience. In fact, it's learning from things that didn't work out as planned that strengthens and deepens a relationship between partners. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. I'm Craig Stoddard, KF9MP, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Long before I took my rail trip with Amateur Radio, I researched it online and was surprised by the number of people, non-hams, who buy and program handheld scanners to listen to the train crews and dispatchers along the way. When our train was delayed due to a freight train on the same tracks with a busted airline, I was the only passenger that knew the actual reason for the delay, even more than many of the people working on board the train. Most hams love to talk with and meet people, which is one of the big attractions on Amtrak. Talking to people in the dining car, I was surprised by the number of people who are riding the train as the vacation. 
seeing the sights in a more relaxed atmosphere, and a very nice way to sleep at night. Some people purchased 30-day rail passes and were traveling what they called the Big Circle, which had them going from Chicago to Seattle to Los Angeles to New Orleans to Washington, D.C. and back to Chicago. They'd get off in the larger cities for a couple of days and do laundry and get readjusted to a bathroom that doesn't rock side to side, then repack and reboard another train and continue their round the nation rail adventure. Many of these big circle people brought a GPS along and used a windshield mount to hold it into the window in their sleepers. Using a GPS on the train to see exactly where you are and how fast you're moving, I learned a valuable lesson. Those GPS units designed for the car that give turn-by-turn -turn directions are not ideal for use on the train, but they do work. So many of these GPS devices also now give warnings when you drive more than 10 miles an hour over the posted speed limit. But on the train, you're never in control of how fast the train moves, and there are no school zones. But the GPS doesn't know that and beeps and flashes warnings regardless. And even though the train tracks show up on the GPS, the little car icon will always appear on the nearby road instead. For all my future rail trips, I'm going to use a handheld GPS instead, something that doesn't warn me when my train is going 60 miles an hour in a school zone. On my trip, I worked out a schedule to talk to a couple hams I know in Central Texas. For my train ticket I printed the day I purchased it, I knew what room I'd be in, and I also found a floor plan of the rail car I'd be in online so I knew who I could talk to based on what side of the train I'd be on. Since the stainless steel body tends to make your radio signal somewhat directional out the nearest window. But one thing I didn't account for is that all train cars except the engines can run in either direction. So until you get on board the train you'll never know for sure what side you'll be on. And at large stations where they add or remove cars, your car may be turned around so you'll have no promise of being on any particular side of the train for the entire trip. To sum up, some important things I learned about taking amateur radio on the rails are 1. Keep your radio concealed. There are usually things near the window you can use to wedge your HT right next to the glass. Always use an earphone or headset and program all the VHF rail channels before you travel. And be sure to download all the dispatch frequencies in cities your train stops so you can stay informed. That way you'll know more than most of the people on your train. 2. Handheld GPS like the Model 20X works better than turn-by-turn -turn GPS for the car. 3. The passenger cars have electrical outlets all over the place for charging your HT or computer, but I'd bring spare batteries anyway. 4. Some good reasons not to take the train would be that you're in a big hurry, or you must arrive exactly on time, or you're a heavy cigarette smoker, or you're addicted to Facebook and Twitter. 5. If your HT also works as a broadcast receiver, it may work better than you think, maybe because the rail cars are so tall, you're usually on the second story, and we all know that higher is better for hams. And last, I had pretty decent coverage with a small 3G hotspot for cellular data along the way, but I still brought my repeater directory and talked to hams in five states and had a great time on the rail. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP in sunny Phoenix, Arizona, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. ARRL has released a white paper that provides some context to explain proposed alterations to its Articles of Association and bylaws that the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors recommended for full board passage at its April 21st meeting. The study continues of the so-called Code of Conduct for Board Members, known officially as the ARRL Policy on Board Governance and Conduct of Members of the Board of Directors and Vice Directors, with changes to be recommended for later board consideration. At its January meeting, the Board pledged to provide membership with the rationale and purpose behind the proposed changes that it had adopted in last July's meeting. In April, the EC recommended minor revisions to two amendments to the ARRL's Articles of Association and one change to its bylaws for the board. One proposed change involved the wording of the articles that address indemnification and personal liability. Although the board had adopted new Articles 15 and 16 at the July 2017 meeting, ARRL's Connecticut Council recommended two revisions requiring board approval to make the wording of those changed sections consistent with Connecticut state statutes. Article 15 addresses personal liability of directors, vice directors, and volunteer and staff officers for damages due to a breach of duty in their respective roles. Article 16 provides indemnification of directors and volunteer staff and officers for any monetary judgment based on any actions taken or failure to take action except under the circumstances listed in Article 15. A change to the wording of Article 1 would add ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, as an informal name for the organization, in addition to the American Radio Relay League. 
This adds the informal name of the organization to the formal name spelled out in Article 1 to indicate that either rendering is a proper description of the organization. A clarification of the director's vice director's election cycle, also spelled out by Law 23, was required. This involved only a wording change to include correct years involved. The minutes of the April 21st AWRL Executive Committee meeting, including the specific wording of proposed changes, that the board made two specific edits to the Code of Conduct in its January meeting and directed EC to review the remaining provisions with the intention of presenting those to the full board. The EC began that process at its April meeting, considering a simplified version of the document recommended by the National Council of Nonprofits, but realized it would take longer than anticipated to complete this review and present its findings to the board at the membership. The EC expects to have a discussion and a proposal for the board's consideration later this year. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.